Hi, everyone, and welcome to our program tonight. My name is Colin Von Leetog, and I'm the Assistant Director for Alumni Career Development with the Rutgers University Alumni Association. Thank you all for being with us tonight for part one of a very special two-part program uh, on emotional intelligence, which is brought to you by the RUAA. And when I think of the many personal and professional challenges that we all face day in and day out, uh, career, raising children, the return to work during the pandemic, and so much more, I'd be hard pressed to find a singular element that is present at the intersectionality of all of these things, like the need for emotional intelligence. And we are so fortunate to have an expert in the field with us tonight. In short, Kelly Minnell leads organizations through transformative growth, and there's a lot to unpack there. For Maru Health Inc., uh, Kelly designs and develops specific emotional intelligence content and trains coaches to deliver on the Maru promise for non-clinical participants. As a Daniel Goleman meta coach, she trains new coaches in EI skill sets, sharing her knowledge of world-renowned research to improve effectiveness of workplace relationships at all levels, including leadership success, global competitiveness, and diversity. She's on speed dial for many C-suite leaders and is an expert executive coach with over 30 years of consulting experience. As a coach for the newly founded Goldman EI organization, Kelly brings 30 years of experience in the weight of the Daniel Goldman research and brand to her assignments. Through her affiliation with Corn Ferry, Kelly delivers the 360 ESCII, providing customized solutions for your organization's vision, trajectory, and growth points. Kelly's a writer and frequent guest speaker to industry and has been a contributor to the Forbes Coaches Council and speaks as a keynote to industry leaders. In addition, Kelly has also worked as a consultant and coach for many Fortune 100 companies, including leading organizations in transportation, finance, manufacturing, education, and healthcare. Kelly Minnell is the founder, chief visionary officer of EI Global Inc. and the newly launched global initiative around the democratization of emotional intelligence skills. Joining Kelly tonight to assist with questions and event management is her colleague, Mayu Pohola, Strategic Marketing Manager at Maru Health. Mayu is an enthusiastic marketing professional with a passion for raising awareness and reducing the stigma for those living with behavioral health concerns. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our events team, Stephanie, uh, as well as Sam, our regional uh, colleague in Florida for helping to make this program possible as well. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. So I just wanted to give you a big shout out up front. And without further ado, please remember to submit your questions throughout the program. You can do it right there in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Well, Colin, thank you so much. That's pretty, uh, <laughs> it's pretty overwhelming listening to all of that information. So, um, so to not waste any of your time, I'm going to begin and share my screen immediately and let me know. Mayu, can you see everything okay? Okay, I don't hear you, but okay, I trust you. <laughs> Text me. All right, so, um, well, good evening, We can't everyone. see your screen just yet, Kelly. You, you cannot, or yes? No. Not yet? No, we cannot. Uh, okay, let me see what, uh, what, we need to change here in order to make that happen. Hold on one sec. We just had this working just one second ago, didn't we? How about now? Are you? No, still nothing. Huh, okay, one more time, here we go. Let's try one more time. Yeah, uh, we just switched over to co-host um, for the event. It looks like it's coming through now. We're good. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, good. All right. So it should work. Should work now. Yeah, we can see your screen now. All right. So do you see the presenters portion of the screen and not the speaker notes? We see the speaker notes. All right. We will do a switch. Yeah, it, it, might, it might have needed to. Uh, how about now? Uh, still speaker notes. Goodness, we just did this. Hold on a second, guys. Sorry about that. That's all right. Take your time. And while Kelly's pulling up the presentation, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we will have a second part of this, uh, which many of you have already registered for. But as a reminder, the second part next week, same time, same place, uh, 4 p.m., uh, Tuesday on the 11th is going to be really interactive and a chance for us to practice a lot of what we're learning here. 
um, you know, in terms of emotional intelligence and, and really putting it into the practice and, and a great opportunity to engage socially with one another too. So if you haven't registered, please do so. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Colin, looks like we finally got it. <laughs> We're good to go. Thank you all. Yes, thank you so very much. So um, as Colin had mentioned, um, this past year and a half, we've all experienced disruption in ways this planet has not seen in over 100 years. We're not only experiencing a COVID-19 pandemic, we're experiencing a pandemic of fear and a global mental health crisis. It's my intent today to provide a short overview of some of the work surrounding emotional intelligence, some key observations from a practitioner's point of view, from the field, a coach, someone who has practiced coaching, leadership training, and organization development using the gifts of emotional intelligence, and leaning on the leading researchers in the field. Our session next week, part two, as Colin mentioned, will discuss and practice ways in which we can develop our emotional intelligence. And of course, joining me today is Mayu. Thank you, Mayu. She's taken time out from her schedule of a global launch party, so I really do appreciate that. Also during this hour, we're going to take four polls around stress, well-being, resilience, and self-awareness, so stay tuned. So while in this isolation, people began to find things to do, and as you may recall, the sock puppet in isolation, eating cars and scoring points. A year which working from home went from 4% to a 48%, according to a recent Gallup poll, also stated in the new book, Wellbeing at Work, that rising mental health challenges were the number one barrier for employers, and that the organizations need to prioritize building a coaching culture to support managers from being just bosses and teaching them how to lead. The pandemic also provided ways for people to become creative, innovative, and begin to look for solutions for their suffering and challenges. Interesting, even recently I found out, I live in Jacksonville, Florida, I found out that Zillow announced that Jacksonville, Florida is the number one for digital nomads, and I can see why. It's warm weather, the beaches, the rentals were a good price, and so now we're we're very busy here with a lot of digital nomads. Everybody's filling up the cafes with their laptops. Because I spend so much time in coaching and leadership development in the healthcare field, I confess I have a little bit of a bias today around the crisis as it relates also to the mental health care and mental health in healthcare. I, like my colleagues and peers, are consumed by how we can help. What is a way forward? So like Mr. Rogers, I like to look to the helpers. So recently when I was doing a session for the healthcare environment, a group of doctors in town, I started with this slide because I thought it spoke interestingly to the doctors who are beginning to say their patients were more concerned about them than they were about others, right? The quotes on this page come from experienced coaching leaders in a variety of industries, including healthcare during the pandemic, may relate to some of these comments yourself as leaders have voiced the struggle managing their teams and themselves during this time. However, today there's a shortage of mental health providers. The National Council of Behavioral Health reported that 77% of countries in the counties in the US are experiencing a shortage of mental health professionals. Increasingly, innovators are looking to take this and take this gap with the help of tech perhaps. The quote, this gentleman mentioned, who will look in on me, really hit me and speak to the profound loneliness so many have experienced. Some of these are specific and some are amalgamation of some of the clients. So let's take a look at stress and take a poll around our stressors. Stress means the situation in which a person feels tense, restless, nervous, or anxious, or is unable to Sleep at night because this individual's mind is troubled all the time. How much do you feel this kind of stress these days? Watching the results come in. All right, so this question, I was very thankful for Valerie, our chief research officer at Maru, for providing these questions that have validity. All right, we're looking at three. We still have a considerable amount in the top four and five as well. And some people, fortunately, are not experiencing 
too much of their stress. So if everybody's completed, there's still a few, few more coming in, so I'll let it ride for a second. So what, you, what you're noticing is a great deal of the participants here are experiencing some, some levels of stress. Interesting. Let's take a look and share those results. Can everybody see those results? Yeah? So let's take a look at four levels of stress as outlined by the National Institute of Health. General stress, everyone has this type of stress and it resolves itself in a few days. No intervention is typically required. Then we can move to cumulative stress. This can build up in our body. It's harder to relieve these symptoms. And you may experience more physical symptoms and anguish. The third is the acute traumatic stress which is critical incident stress, produces considerable psychological distress. And so when the cumulative stuff doesn't resolve itself, we can be moving into acute. And then of course, when that doesn't resolve, we can move into post-traumatic. So if everybody can see the results of this poll, Colin, can they see it? Yes. Okay, very good. So we'll move on from that. So it's very interesting. What we're seeing now are in coaching and in, of course, in the mental health environments, we're seeing acute and post-traumatic stress growing in environments. So why emotional intelligence? So in the past few decades of research is focused on the use of EI in work performance and has demonstrated benefits to both professionally and personally, because we know that the same person who goes to work also goes home. When we improve the person, so goes the work performance. So some of the examples of the benefits for the individual include better health, improved relationships, ability to resolve personal conflict, less stress, which of course translate into the workplace. I have colleagues who through the Goldman organization train Olympic athletes using EI as a way to help them understand how their emotions affect their performance and their ability to focus. For organizations, they often see fewer accidents, less loss of work, higher productivity across all lines. There's an enormous amount of research located at the EI Consortium, which is housed at Rutgers University, by the way. Here's another example in the healthcare. This, is, this was a study done by Corn Ferry, interestingly. Nurses, nurse managers with higher EI scores, have lower staff turnover, higher frequency of personal and practice behaviors, and higher staff patient and doctor satisfaction. Daniel Goleman describes industry skills and knowledge as threshold competencies. They are entirely necessary in order to get into the room, get to the prize job and such. From that point on, it is the EI competencies that begin to distinguish the stars from the average performers. The benefits of the employer are tremendous, as many studies demonstrate that those who exhibit EI skills cannot perform others from 70 to 90%, depending on the skills. A recent article by a doctor who's the medical director of the Palo Alto Medical Foundation shown that over 50% of the physicians reporting significant symptoms of burnout is estimated that the general public may be suffering from depression and anxiety growing from 20 to 53% post COVID and estimated to be even higher for medical professionals. The National Academy of Medicine, as well as many medical groups have launched initiatives to offer intervention and support. Gallup's report yesterday mentioned that people who thrive have a 53% better attendance, are more resilient and can generally show up you talked about well-being as an additive to performance. In other words, it's hard for people to be resilient if they're burned out. Here's another example of physician mental health. So what we see is that all the civil unrest also is playing out in society, is playing out in the medical industry as the rules of engagement are challenged by individuals within the industry. 
refusing to play by the old rules. If you follow Med Twitter, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm excited also by the initiative at Loyola University that recognized the rates of burnout in their medical students and conducted a research study to limit burnout. The group focused on how emotional intelligence of an EI individual correlates with better stress management, general wellness. Emotional intelligence is defined as the individual's ability to manage one's own emotions and identify the emotions of others. Higher levels of EI has been linked to greater resilience, better stress management, and immunity to burnout. So what's interesting is because of the group's finding Loyola University has employed emotional intelligence in the school for all levels. Because of my HR background, I received daily newsletters from the Society for Human Resources. I just received this newsletter the other day informing employers of a recent study of employee burnout, studying the Psychiatric Association Foundation in Washington, DC. As you can see, the employers are aware they're calling us left and right for advice. So let's take another poll pretty soon, but let's look at resilience for a second. The APA defines resilience as the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. When we go through EI curriculum, as you'll see in just a few minutes of outline of EI, we tackle exactly these skill sets as well. So let's take another poll on well-being. Overall, how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? So while that's coming in, very good. Very good, interesting, yeah. So while that's coming in, I'd like to talk about the Wellbeing Project, the Global Wellbeing Project initiative created by Gallup and established for the Planet Earth Foundation. They joined forces to establish a more inclusive and global understanding of well-being by incorporating cross-cultural perspectives into the science of well-being with the goal of significantly enhancing our knowledge in this important topic. The key topics that are addressed are the understanding of well-being in challenging contexts such as COVID-19, societal and individual interventions to increase well-being, the shortcomings of traditional approaches to well-being, new concepts and measures to advance a global view of well-being. The Gallup World Poll will be finalized and delivered. They said this last month, they're a few days late, so I'm looking forward to seeing the results of this survey when it comes out as well. So it looks like we have some interesting results where a great number of people are quite satisfied with several mentioning that they're not so much, but we're averaging in a six, seven, eight range as well here. I'll leave the poll open for one more minute. So what is this all about in terms of competencies or skills? We talk about skills as being an ability or behavior. They're on top of the iceberg. They're easy to see. They're easier to develop. Everyone can notice what's going on. I'm gonna share these results so that you can see them. Can you see these results as well? So when we talk about competencies, we talk about those that are beneath and they have the opportunity to be developed throughout all of our life, but they can be harder to see. They can be harder to develop. So let's take a look at my, one of my favorite slides. And this is the slide, Daniel Goleman's competency model, which is what we call the gold standard to understand this body of work. So what essentially is emotional and social intelligence? It's the capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others, for motivating ourselves and for managing emotions effectively in ourselves and in others. It describes the behaviors that sustain people in challenging roles or as their careers become more demanding. And it captures the qualities that help people deal effectively with change. So as you can see, there are four general domains. We like to say there's self-awareness, self-management, 
which has a number of skills tucked inside, social awareness and relationship management. When we teach these skills, we always teach them from the left to the right. As you can imagine, it may be difficult to manage a teamwork engagement without first understanding our emotional and social awareness. So what are some of the things that coaches helped to do when they're teaching these types of skills? So one of the things is by teaching perspective. Perspective taking is one of the things that Brene Brown talks about when she teaches empathy, empathy towards self, which is what we call self-compassion. It's having the ability to develop perspective, which is a critical skill in work and on developing our emotional intelligence. The other specific skill we use to address these competencies is focus. Neuroscientist and collaborator, Dr. Dan Siegel, his most famous quote, he says, what we focus on grows. And what he's talking about is neuropathways. Dan Siegel's transformed the field of psychotherapy with his pioneering work in interpersonal neurobiology. His groundbreaking mindset approach, based on decades of research and clinical practice in the areas of mindfulness, neuroscience and attachment, prove that it transform and improve therapeutic outcomes. We'll address more of the specific skills in part two next week. Let's take another, another survey, another poll. This one, my might have some commentary on. This one is less scientific, but it was something that was happened in a workshop that she attended recently. And she enjoyed seeing the answers. Yeah. Maya, you want to weigh in? <laughs> this is really um, well. I think we're gonna we're gonna see the results, and they're gonna be pretty self-explanatory. So, <laughs> looking looking <laughs> okay. forward to that. <laughs> Do you want to tell us uh, what in a second what you find, what your commentary on it is? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to once everyone's voted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to tell you, Mayu is um, such a fabulous collaborator, and, um, and she's also from the happiest place on the planet. So it, put in the chat box where you think that she's from. See if you can guess. Anybody know where the happiest place on the planet is? Oh, we're getting there. You're in the right, oh, somebody just did it. I didn't see any New Jersey in here. <laughs> That's not New Jersey. <laughs> so Maya, you wanna tell them where you're from? There's a few that get it. Yeah, I think Tom S was correct. I'm from Finland, the happiest country in the world for fifth time in a row or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll tell you, working with her, it just, it's just so infectious. There's something called emotional contagion. And Mayu, just whoever she works with, you just get finished working with her and you have a session and then all of a sudden, then you feel fantastic because her beautiful mood and her happiness and her joy is so contagious that you just feel so fantastic every time you, you work with her, which is why I love to work with her. <laughs> so I, I think thank the you, Kelly. Is, you are so welcome. I think they're done pretty much. Doesn't look like there's too many more coming in. 51 of 59 wrote it. So what do you think? You want to share your observations that the professor that in the class that you attended? Right. Do you want to share the, the results? I think you have oh, the button. I yes, I do have the button. <laughs> I keep clicking it. Okay. Did you see it? All right. This is exactly what I saw in the class that I attended. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm no coach, but <laughs> I think you can probably um, tell more about what these results tell about self-awareness. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you have to, you have to, you have to peel it back for us a little bit. What did your professor say in that class? <laughs> well, they said that um, this is exactly what we see every time they do this, um, this poll, and uh, it's kind of like. Um, how do you say this like backwards that people think most people think that they're more self-aware than their peers which actually set, tells a lot about our self-awareness that we are actually not as self-aware as we could be there so we that's go what pass, that's <laughs> what he postulates darn <laughs> uh, to show how many people are on the call to provide a perspective so colin how many people are on the call Uh, I can pull that number for you momentarily. I'll, I'll let you know. All right, good. All right, so we'll we'll move on here. So I want to introduce somebody to you I think is is interesting because when we talk about emotional intelligence, we have to even back up one more step, and that step is the introduction of mindfulness. Right, this concept of mindfulness is important to us because by being mindful we have the ability to become more self-aware. So I'll say that again, to be mindful is to be present and enables us to become self-aware, right? And so with the curriculum that's been designed by dear friends in the marketplace, they call it search inside yourself. Many of you might become familiar with that. This, this concept of searching inside yourself continues to build that search. And the, the more we search, the more we find out we learn, the more we find out or think that we, there's more to learn, right? And so I wanna introduce John Kapitzen, who is a leader in this area, because I know that during this session, I wanted to introduce you to a lot of um, leaders in this arena. John Kapitzen has been responsible for introducing the mindfulness into Western medicine. So what he's demonstrated to Western minds is that mindfulness is the way that can be measured. Scans of brains for those who meditate, for instance, show the prefrontal cortex becomes physically larger for those who do not. Even after a short period of time, scans show a significant enough change, which was encouraging for beginners. MBSR is now considered the gold standard in Western medicine. The pandemic accelerated the growth of the mindfulness movement and communities as people have been looking for ways to reduce their suffering. So just for a kick in the chat, do you, any of you out there to have a mindfulness practice? If you do, do you use an app? If you have an app or something, do you have a favorite app? I'll be curious to see which ones become your favorite apps. Headspace, very popular. Yeah. Ah, Insight Timer. Yes. Very popular ones. Calm. Very nice. So I could see that there's a lot of people and it's become less stigmatized by using apps and using um, tech, so to speak, instead of perhaps sitting with a mindful teacher on a mat somewhere in a classroom, which the pandemic disabled for us. So people ran to ways that we can do it in a different way. So what is self-awareness? As we talked about it the whole time, self-awareness is the ability to tune in to our own emotions. It's the foundation, foundational skill of all of the emotional intelligence skills. A mindful practice can help us begin this pro process. By being mindful, we can build upon our self-awareness and learn to grow in this awareness. By tuning in, we can see how emotions play a role in our performance. We can learn about our strengths and potential limitations offering us confidence or motivation to work harder at something new. So I think this is one of our last polls and this is on resilience. And this is really an interesting component because we talked a lot about stress. We talked about um, well-being. We talked about resilience. So here's a new poll. It's up right now. So consider how well the statement describes you. I actively look for ways to replace the losses I encounter in life. Interesting. Resilience is often talked about using the word sometimes grit or how well do we bounce back, for instance. 
resilience is talked about in that way as well. Okay, I can see there's so many different ways that people have meditated and used apps in different ways that they have done it. Very good. So our polls almost finished, 43 of 56. Most people have voted. So how important is resilience in your life? If you have a chance to chat something, how well do you feel you've developed your resilience or have you been focusing on your resilience during the pandemic? I think the poll's almost finished. So I'd like to introduce a group, and I talked about Maru earlier, is an organization that I find quite interesting because we talked about disruptors in the marketplace and Maru Health developed a solution to the mental health care space. The three founders' ambition is to scale to empower 10 million people with mental challenges by 2027. I find it quite interesting. And so I wanted to draw attention to this particular study that my colleague shared. It's about a Cap Gemini study that talked about when we teach emotional intelligence in the workplace, the ROI was tremendous. They talked about a 63% increase in production, 62% higher employee satisfaction, 61% in market share. But take a look at this number, 54% in this particular sample, better emotional and mental well-being. That is really exciting information because those of us who've worked with this work for a long time see and experience this work and we can see it in our industry. So we're gonna say, we're gonna show these results. Here we go. Here's our resilience scores here. Most people falling in the number four. Very interesting here. So it's interesting that this group is found to be recognized by the Digital Health Awards as one of the top mental health companies in the digital space validating clinical research and published in peer-reviewed journals. So this is very, very interesting work. And it has intrigued me so much that Maru has asked me to help create some content for them. And I'm so delighted to help them with their emotional intelligence model. So they've taken it the next step. So for the non-clinical side and looking to prevention, Maru Health's coaching program designed to help employee deal with mild anxiety, symptoms, and stress. This is a great way for the client to enhance their mental health offerings to their employees and provide a prevention solution to be more proactive in the mental well-being space. Very interesting. So as you can see, we use the same particular areas, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. And when we teach these skills, we see people improving their well-being and their resilience and lowering their stress. Put the poll back up there for you to see one more time. So the early results are absolutely fascinating. It's wonderful to see that the rates of resilience and well-being especially moved so dramatically and provided value and encouragement for managing the life situations of workers. And I know this particular population, there were teachers and engineers and leaders in this particular sample, which is absolutely fa fabulous to see these results coming through. So when we think about it, everybody's saying, what can we do for people in the workplace? And the conversation has come way far from, well, what is balance and then how do we get it? The conversation is a lot more complicated than that now. Everyone wants to know how do we develop and sustain work-life balance. So the answer is not that simple and it's not a static answer. The solution has more to do with teaching employees EI and coping skills so that they can shift their balance throughout the day, all day and every day. Just as this world-class surfer is doing, is she ever static? She's always shifting. She's using her balance or her compass to make millions of muscle movements maintaining her focus and keeping her perspective. She's self-aware in her mind, her body, and her limitations. She's in the moment. She's perhaps in the flow and navigating every moment. 
This is how I would like to describe these set of skills. They enable us to dig deep and successfully navigate whatever waves come our way. And of course, we can't move on without mentioning this subject. <laughs> so I made several references to this stress and sometimes we talk about that as the amygdala hijack because I do not like to teach by showing pictures of the brain. I thought this might be a better story. Then Goldman's description of the amygdala is the brain is an elegant machine for survival. In mammals, you need to have a brain that registers emotions as our emotions have evolved to fill a primary survival function. Everything we see and hear is scanned by the amygdala to determine whether it's a threat. Do I eat it? Will it eat me? Today, this email, is this email going to eat me? Is this person cutting me off in traffic going to eat me? Well, we know it will not, but our brains and our physical responses may feel as though, yes, this email or tweet or Facebook post might eat me. The amygdala would rather be safe than sorry and has the ability to create a rush of stress hormones. And this is how the brain processes this information. So if we're in a state of stress or fearfulness, the amygdala can prime us to focus on everything that is scaring us. And its processing of information includes physiological responses, increased heartbeat, glandular secretions, etc. It makes us act as we are in a typical fight or flight. So what do we do? We can learn to recognize when we are distracted. With stress, we get stuck in a loop of our thoughts. We can always ground ourselves with a simple breath. We can train ourselves to return to the present. We can train ourselves to take notice, drop the thought and return from our head to our bodies. I like to teach you a simple exercise that if you would like, you could follow. So if you'd like to all join me, this has two parts to it. And the exercise goes like this. We breathe in, I'm doing my best. And we breathe out and I reset. We'll do it again. We breathe in, I'm doing my best. And we breathe out and I reset. Now, we may be receptive to resonating with others. So once we have somehow mastered the ability to be with ourselves, we have the capacity to be with others. This picture for me illustrates how we can be in and maintain resonant relationships. My family has a long and strong musical history, so I often like to use music as a language to teach resonance. As you may be aware, the first violinist's job is to come onto the stage and attune the orchestra to an A440 resonance. When one is out of tune, most there can hear it. This illustrates the work of Richard Biasis, which co-designed the ESCII that Colin mentioned, the Emotional and Social Competency Inventory with Dan Goleman. That's the ability that we're talking about to tune in to others in our lives and sustain these relationships. We talk about this as having social radar, the ability to see and hear and read the room. So how do we do this? We need empathy. Empathy is the key to connecting with others as we will have the ability to see things and to sense unspoken emotions in others and in teams. Those who demonstrate empathy understand how to listen attentively, are able to use deep listening skills and listen to understand. To return to our musical illustration, listening is central to attunement with another. As we are gathering information of which song, musical notation, chords, and rhythm are being used to express this emotion. Experiencing empathy is holding a deep connection with another person whose emotions are being expressed in a variety of ways. We can use our senses to listen with our ears and hear with our heart. Each moment we spend attuning to others creates a pathway for us to constructively connect. And so we may begin to have a glimmer of why these skills seem 
to be so urgent for organizations. So here's an example of one organization that believes heavily in mindfulness. As you can see, the mindfulness little cushion there in the corner, part of running a world-class technology company with a market cap of more than 135 billion, gives your employees the space to put their technology aside and take time to be quiet, says Mark Benoff. Also, my brother, my little brother, works for Salesforce. And he said it took him a while to get the idea of using the mindfulness. Now I believe that he's, he's a bit of a fan. So, and of course, there is a much bigger picture here. And I've been referencing a lot of science and researchers today that were part of the origin team of bringing this work and this body of work into both science and the academia and the, into the business world. And I like to reference and introduce new players all the time, all right? My dear friend, Michelle Maldonado, was asked to speak to the UN on global sustainability and shared her perspective on how by learning emotional intelligence skills, we may have the ability to create a sustainable solution for the planet. As you can see, a lot of people are thinking big around this discussion. Darren once said, and I paraphrase, evolutionary, evolutionarily, we do not survive without taking care of the most, of the most vulnerable among us. It is imperative on us to learn these skills so that we can build a kind and compassionate planet. So with that, I will stop sharing and say hi. Thank you, Kelly, for, for walking us through uh, emotional intelligence and, and so many of the applications of it and, and implications of it as well. Um, we do have some, some great audience questions here, so I want to make sure we, we have plenty of time to get to those. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we, we, we did frame this discussion a little bit around uh, return to work and, you know, systemic racism, uh, a lot of the division and, and challenges that we're experiencing. Um, in the country, but in the world, you know, these days and, and the really uniquely challenging times. Uh, as we prepare the, the next generation for, for life, you know, in, in this planet and hopefully start to make um, uh, improvements in, in society, um, how can we work on developing these skills in school age children? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um... So yes, there's a group uh, called KSOL. It's uh, actually started by a friend of Dan Goldman's and I believe they might've met at Yale. So the um, KSOL organization has been working in the K through 12 space. They have a set of competencies and fortunately they're now becoming much more in demand. I've introduced KSOL to so many educational environments. And um, so what they've been able to identify are sets of competencies from for a four or five year old, which might look like the person could maybe sit in their chair for three or four minutes, then they might be able to manage this activity, right? Or if they might be able to play successfully with another person um, it, with the same toy or having a successful back and forth, then they could get to move on to the next thing, right? And what's interesting about the social emotional skills that Casel talks about uh, is about that they focus on the social emotional versus the academic skills. So for instance, you're in 11th grade and you're still not sitting in your chair. Well, you might not get promoted to 12th grade, even though you could do the math test, right? Because we really do want you to sit in your chair. So when we look at adults, the people that don't manage it um, in their work life, you see the CEOs, they get hired for their skill and they get fired for their, their lack of self-management. You could just catalog them all in that, in that bucket. You probably catch most of them. And so we want that 11th grader to self-manage, right? Uh, Dan's also written some books on that. And there've been, um, if you look, uh, if you Google Dan Goleman, he's written some book, books on that in terms of uh, raising emotionally intelligent children. And I would look for any of anybody that Dan collaborates with because Dan collaborates with people um, that have a scientific background and they have used evidence-based work. 
don't know if that yeah. helps. But essentially, if I were a parent, for instance, starting today, I would look for books on social emotional learning for my child and work from that space. Absolutely. Yeah. And fortunately, more and more seems to be coming out uh, in those regards and, and across mediums, too. You know, so so something that's accessible for everyone. Um, yeah. When we look at these principles, right, that, that we teach uh, children and the competencies that you're speaking about, um, you know, things that are going to support emotional intelligence, like empathy, uh, it doesn't always seem to mesh with what we end up coming to value as adults. And, and, and the things that um, we show an appreciation for, like, let's say, competitiveness, for example. Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, people feel a sense of discouragement with that, uh, especially if they are practicing emotional intelligence. And that can also lead to anxiety, depression, um, you know, other, other feelings of, of kind of being displaced in the world. And, and one of our mm -hmm. questions really speaks to that and, and is so profound, I think. Um, how does a morally evolved human with integrity exist in a society that has deeply ingrained systemic racism? And, um, you know, also as we look at some of the, the we could say business um, cultural values that we have uh, with, you know, getting more and, and accumulation and uh, things that might be a little bit counter to emotional intelligence and um, things like empathy. So, so how does someone who tries to practice this uh, maybe not so feel so discouraged by it? Yeah, that's a lot to unpack on. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a part two, fortunately, right? So. <laughs> I, I get that question a lot when I'm, when I'm coaching and, some, and the person becomes more self-aware that they would like to lead with compassion, right? Lead with empathy and that they see a colleague maybe taking somebody out by their knees and thinking, well, that might be how we used to do it, but I don't want to be that way any longer. I don't want to teach my children how to be that way. I don't want to um, go to sleep at night thinking that's how I had to get, get ahead. And so a lot of this has to do with how we even define success for ourselves. And I encourage anyone who is in that space to draw some really hard boundaries, which of course, there's a really good book out right now called Boundary Boss. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I started listening to it the minute it was published. And she talks a lot about uh, how to build boundaries, especially in this sort of a time where there, everything is bombarding us. And uh, we have media, our children, I mean, when we grew up, we didn't have this kind of media, Colin, that they, the students have now. And so we have to draw boundaries in every aspect of our life. And so that requires our mindful practice to take center stage. And by drawing boundaries, having our mindful practice center stage in our life and making room for those who have values that are shared by you and being in quiet spaces with people that support you and love you. And this can take some doing. I mean, this year was, this last couple of years has been very disruptive for a lot of people in terms of finding and holding on to people that care and love for them in that way. And so I say work within your sphere of control will increase your sphere of influence over time. Focus on your sphere of control. And that's your mindful practice that enables us to stay focused on what matters, what are our values, how does that motivate us, and towards what end, right? But as John Kabat-Zinn shows us, our mindful practice gives us and offers us an enormous amount of wisdom. And when you find that inner wisdom, that person's in there, we call them their, in, their our inner coach. I tell my clients, find, you know, we're going to find our inner coach. You can even name her or him and say, okay, and then you can have a conversation with that inner coach when you have a struggle moment, right? So I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah, at the heart of it really is one of the main pillars of, of emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness, knowing when you need that support, where can you access it, where are the feelings coming from, what are my motives, my values, and staying in tune with those things, very much so. Yeah. Um, yeah. As we look at uh, shifting gears a little bit to the workplace now, um, we have a, a number of questions around that, so I'm going to kind of package a couple of them together here. Um, when we look at, at the idea of creating positive change, leadership development, how we can grow as individuals, um, we have this two-part kind of combo question here. One is from the worker's perspective, if you will, and the other is from a leadership 
kind of perspective. So uh, how can we handle stress in the workplace nowadays? Uh, specifically, if you're at a new company or you're working remotely, you're returning to work from the pandemic, um, where it just kind of feels like business as usual and you know, people are maybe doing a, a quick kind of check-in to get the pulse, but it's nothing really meaningful, um, especially during the pandemic times here. Yes, I, I'm really glad you asked that because a lot of people are asking that right now. Employers are saying, I can't even find my employees. <laughs> they're, they're not even sure where they are right now. Um, Google found out that many of their employees moved out of the area and they're now having to revisit this whole concept of do we, how do we get them back at all? Um, so this is a very interesting conversation. And I would encourage everyone to go back to what I call your mindfulness practice and what's important to you and be proactive with your workspace. I'm working with uh, one healthcare environment where the, the executive said, my gosh, we're doing so much and we're working day and night and there's no day and there's no night anymore. And my boss said, we can hardly wait to get you back in the office because you've all been on a vacation for 15 months. Well, that did not sit well with anybody on that team. And so I think we've got to be proactive with our workspaces and when, as we reconnect, um, re-sync up with everybody. Like, what did you think we were doing all this time? And, and how, how is it going to look moving forward? And are we going to take Zoom calls at midnight anymore? And, and so we might have to revisit all of our working behaviors again. Just like we revisited Colin when we built all this, so you should see the setup I have here, right? We didn't have to do this before, right? Now, if we're moving back in the office, what are our new boundaries? Are we gonna be expected to work one day a week or is it two days a week? Or what is that now going to look like? And are we gonna share space? Or are, we, are we going to have our new space? And so having patience with ourselves and with our employers, because it's going to take a little time because we're kind of rewriting the rules of engagement. So be patient with yourself, make lists of things that concern you, bring them into your employer and say, you know, I really want to mindfully and respectfully visit these topics with you right now, right? And make space, self-respect for yourself as you move into this new space and be patient, be very patient. Right, something that we can helps practice on bit. ourselves as much as we do with anyone else, I guess, right? Well, I don't assume your employer is going to have a really wonderful plan because this is an enormous overload for these HR people. I know I'm getting the questions all day long. What should we do? Should we re expect the vaccine? What if they don't do it? I mean, it just, the questions are endless, right? So be patient with yourself. Be patient with your employers. They begin to peel back layer after layer of decisions they may want to make as they move forward. And so again, patience, boundaries, and continued a lot of self-care. Absolutely. And from a, a, for the second part of the question, a, a leadership perspective, how can EI effectively prepare leaders uh, you know, to lead during such challenging times, especially if you're maybe a, a manager early in your career? Right, well, this is a great thing for managers to learn because managers, should they become leaders, do require moving all the way through those spectrums that I mentioned, moving from the left to the right. They need to begin to understand their self-awareness. And then how do they show up? How do they show up in the workplace? Are they a manager? Are they boss, bossy? Or are they gonna be a leader, right? Are they gonna to begin to show up with thoughtful questions for their team and thinking through things in advance? and being able to listen patiently and understand others' perspectives. This takes some real deep learning in terms of EI. What, what, are, my, what are my self driven patterns, right? What do I bring into the workplace, right? How deeply do I listen? Can I self manage while I'm listening to others, right? Right there, just that practice alone is big work for some people. Absolutely. Yeah, if I were becoming a leader, I'd say get yourself an EI coach, really. <laughs> then they can walk you through these competencies and practice. Yeah, it, it touches on so much, you know, uh, that you'll encounter yeah. as a leader and prepares you for it. And, and you know, I think when you're practicing it effectively it helps you with even those um, challenges you can't prepare for, the things that do come up that, that you know, you're, you're not getting trained on. Uh, you can be nimble with it. Yeah. That's right. Um, it, Flexibility it, is, is one of those skills, by the way. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, sticking in the realm of work um, for, for the next part here, uh, when you have coworkers uh, who might be negative, let's say it was worded in the question as toxic or manipulative, uh, or yeah. someone who might be lacking in self-awareness, and, and they may be self-aware enough to tell you that they're not very self-aware. Um, what are some tips that you would have on, on working with people who maybe aren't the best at practicing this? Yeah, this is tough. And a lot of people are also talking about this. Well, I tell, I tell folks that, you know, to draw boundaries and first manage uh, your space so that you have a lot of self-care. And then as you encounter these people, be patient listeners. And if you find you want to engage, um, be a reflective listener for them. And just leave it at that for a little bit, because if you know certain workplaces, you, you might have to always go to a meeting with somebody, right? And they're always frustrated, right? So being a reflective listener might look or sound like this: you say, "Gosh, I noticed the last three meetings, you seemed very frustrated at the our goals, or maybe the ambition of our goals. Is that something we should talk about in the meeting? Perhaps, right? It doesn't mean we have to take on everyone else's frustration." or pain or suffering. So for those high empaths, I know that can be difficult. Again, boundaries. Boundaries also includes what you'll even decide to engage, right? If we don't have the energy, emotional energy to engage one person struggling another person and we're still just trying to get through our own day, that's fair. That's fair in order to take care of ourselves and our families. When we have that extra energy and time, then we can offer and be reflective listener, perhaps. Once we can do that, that, that sometimes provides a lot of support for some people don't want to be fixed always. They, they often just want to be heard. Sometimes by hearing them say what concerns them, they can, they can tackle it themselves. Absolutely. Um, we, we do have a couple more questions. I just want to do a time check. Are we okay to, to stay? Because I know we're at top of the hour now. I'm fine. I'm happy to stay. I see a lot of comments here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, in, in terms of um, current events, uh, given the present climate, um, do you know of uh, EI applications with police departments or law enforcement in any regard? You know, I absolutely, I wish I did. And I'll, I'll bet there's something out there, but I'm not aware of any right now. I'm actually working with and talking to some first responders right now to put some some things together because there there is a, a lot of discussion around that, as you can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and again, just speaks to the ubiquity of uh, how powerful you know that this can be and, and transformational as well. I think. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned some tools and resources for us, some books, and, and we, we talked about, you know, some people are using different apps that they mentioned in the chat and things like that. Uh, but there were a couple questions about tools um, that could help us to stay calm and not overreact, uh, tools to help us strengthen our, our work in EI and, um, uh, and improve that area, and also specifically anything that you'd recommend by, by Dan Goldman. Well, it, really, anything Dan does is is fine. And so, if you Google Dan, especially on YouTube, for instance, and also Dan's got a, a new podcast. Uh, first, uh, so if you Google Dan and his podcast, you will see he and his son Hahnemann have been put together a beautiful podcast this year, and it comes out periodically every few weeks. Is another one that's very well done. So I think you could find that on the app uh, quite easily. So that's a really good place to start. And then what, if you're wanting to explore the topic and you're new to it, then I would say when you look at Dan's work of all the collaborators with, for instance, uh, Richard Biotz and so forth, um, you, you then will see other um, experts in the field. And if you wanna take your learning further, then you can look at those experts as well. The I Consortium column lives on Rutgers campus. Uh, Dan and Dr. Chesney founded that. I understand all the research is sitting there from an academic standpoint, if you're interested in studies. So that's interesting. But on a practical level, I think the podcasts come in very handy. His books come in very handy. And on YouTube, you can see a lot of his lectures at times. And then you often will see him interview other um, experts. Uh, and when you, when you see him uh, uh, talk to another expert, I would then 
if you want to go down the rabbit hole, read that expert's work as well. It's what I've been doing for about the last 25, 30 years. So it, it's a good place to start. That's one of the best parts about research papers is, is when you get to the end and you see the list of references and then it gives so many other touch points for, for other great content. Absolutely. And, and so Absolutely. many different formats, you know, video, podcast, yeah. article, there's something oh, yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. What would you say is the difference between an EI coach and someone who's more of a therapist or a counselor? Oh, that's a great question. So yeah, the therapists have specific training and uh, CBT and other types of, so it's mental health counselors have a very specific curriculum and they, they also have very specific skills around a lot of illnesses and they, they can know how to identify them and take the person through a specific care plan that's very poor, uh, important for them to do. And they also will care coordinate and with other mental health providers as necessary, medication, so forth. Coaches look more forward. They don't look back. Coaches are saying, hey, here's skill development. Here's if we were to look forward, build perspective, build our focus, practice some of these self-awareness, you can easily build skill. If somebody who doesn't have serious clinical challenges can move sometimes more quickly with a coach. Co help, um, coach can help with skill development, right? And at a speed that a person can take this, uh, develop at that whatever speed that is, they can match the speed together. And so somebody who is fairly functional with perhaps struggling because the pandemic, for instance, might do benefit from having an EI coach, right? Uh, also, if it, they're within the same organization, there could be care coordination. If somebody struggles, then they can get, they can get moved uh, to a, a place where they can get more care, which is one thing I really like about what Maru does as well. So they catch people where, where they're needed. And um, that's helpful, has a nice level of protection to it. Yes, yeah, for sure. And, and I think yeah. with our last question here, um, you know, we, we can wrap up in a really great place because it's a, a great uh, uh, opportunity to kind of connect and transition to uh, part two. Um, it gives us a scenario and, and asks for a little bit of advice here in, in a situation. So really the practical component of this. Um, so, uh, our, our audience member writes, my sister and brother-in-law, uh, opened up a small business early on in the pandemic. They're finding it a little difficult at times to work together. Uh, I can tell my sister is concerned with how my brother-in-law interacts with customers. Thoughts on how to approach this potentially sensitive subject with a loved one, uh, AKA mm. you need to learn more emotional intelligence in essence. How do you have that <laughs> conversation with a loved one <laughs> in an emotionally wow. intelligent way, I guess, right? Oh, start with, I love you, brother. And, uh, right. So I love you. And, um, so always come to it from a place of love. You know, when you're working with family, you have an added dynamic of layers of relationship that you have to navigate. So, um, you know, when we talk about emotional deposits and withdrawals for you know, probably a number of people in your audience understand deposits and withdrawals. So there in families, there are a greater number that we have to manage, right? In the workplace, it may be like three to one to manage. Um, with families, it's closer to five or seven to one. So, which means we need many, many, many more deposits before we make a potential withdrawal. So it requires having a lot of self-awareness so that we are aware that we are always making a deposit in this relationship because it's more tender than a work, another type of work relationship. The other thing I'd recommend is that um, they might get a, a EI coach to work with them or a business coach that could help them med mediate some of these conversations. And also there's a, a really good friend of mine wrote a book in, in Gallo for, for Harvard Business. And she wrote a really beautiful book on conflict for, for conflict avoiders and conflict seekers. And so sometimes by managing these kind of conversations, knowing whether you're a conflict avoider or a conflict seeker can be really helpful. And um, she was also one of our professors at, uh, at Goldman, and she taught us a little bit about how to use, successfully use your conflict by understanding if you're a conflict seeker or a conflict avoider. So I hope that helps them a little bit. There's probably a lot more to that, but. <laughs> <laughs> there are always, is, you might need the therapist, the coach and the counselor, right? <laughs> uh, great so questions. I, I, yeah, we, we had such a great audience and, and obviously a, a great uh, facilitator, presenter and, and expert here with us tonight in, in Kelly. So I want to say thank you so much to Kelly and to Mayu, to Sam, to Stephanie, and certainly to our audience for participating. Um, please do join us for the second part of this program.
uh, next week on May 11th at 4 p.m. There will be a link uh, for the registration if you haven't already. It's going to be in the thank you email, or you can always go to ouralumni.com and look up the events uh, there and register there as well and see all the other great kind of programs that we're going to have coming your way. So thanks so much, Kelly. Thank you, Mayu. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Callan. Thank you. Thank Glenn, you. Have a great night, everybody.